in the context of the ongoing budget debates. There's obviously mm -hmm. a lot of conversation about uh, what the appropriate size of the military should be, what we're mm -hmm. actually willing to spend on it, um, and a very fiscally driven um, right. sort of supply side, uh, if you will, approach to to military capability. Um, and and I think that's been a particular challenge for the Army, which is um, being cut substantially, in, mostly to account for the growth that occurred uh, over the course of the last 13 years, but uh, but it looks like beyond that as well. Mm -hmm. a and Army leadership has talked about how that um, presents some degree of risk. So uh, I think this, this concept of risk is always difficult mm -hmm. to translate uh, in meaningful terms uh, to, to the layman, the average person. Yeah. Um, how, how do you do that? How do you, what do you think the risk mm -hmm. represents of mm -hmm. uh, a, an active army at 470 or of 450 or 420 mm -hmm. or lower? Yeah. Um, and, and why should the American people care about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> obviously over the last 10 years we've grown a bit uh, perhaps not as much as some people would uh, s suggest. But uh, we're in the process right now of coming down from about a uh, million one hundred thousand to, and that's across the active army, the National Guard and the, and the uh, reserve force, uh, to a, an army of about uh, one million forty-five thousand. So that's a 490,000 man active force, about 355 in the Guard and then the the, the balance in the in the reserve. Um, we chose to do that without any uh, su significant, if any, re uh, resistance. Uh, we recognized that we had grown, and we didn't need to be, you know, uh, near above, well over a million, uh, as we were. Uh, you know, we had five hundred sixty thousand in the active force uh, over the last ten years, certainly in the latter half of the last decade. Um, and that so that. 1,045,490 in the active force is kind of going back to where we were in the 1980s. That was a known point. We're pretty comfortable that we could respond to most uh, challenges that might arise. We could continue to fulfill our responsibilities in terms of deterrence and engagement around the world and that sort of thing. So that was, you know, it's never easy to get rid of people. Uh, uh, and that change has required a lot of reorganization of the Army, which is, you know, a challenge in and, among, in and of itself, um, but it, that was a known point and we were very comfortable going back there and we knew we needed to do it not only uh, because we couldn't justify the end strength, but the, you know, the nation's got uh, some fiscal challenges uh, that, and so we need to contribute to that. We'll finish that reduction by 2015. Uh, current budget trends will take us down to uh, 980 across the total 980, force, 980,000. Uh, soldiers across the, the three components, about 480,000 in the active force by 2017. Um, not optimal, but we're comfortable that we, we can still meet our uh, global uh, responsibilities. And not just at any given point in time. I say that because uh, we did some very uh, detailed analysis and looked over a 12-year period at the implications of that force because it's not just what can you stack up at any given time. Most things that you wind up getting involved in tend to last more than a month, right? So we looked at a 12-year period. And if you look at any decade since World War II, you'll see that we do between three and five things. And not just the Army, but the, you know, the Department of Defense usually winds up deploying uh, some package of force three to five times in, in a significant amount and in a lot of smaller things. And then there's all of the presence around the world and that sort of thing. So we looked at being able to meet our uh, engagement requirements across the, you know, as dictated by the, uh, the defense strategy and, and uh, the uh, global employment of the force direction that, that we get. Uh, and then uh, whether we could uh, put forces forward, say, to deter something in the Persian Gulf, respond to a major theater war in some point in time, or a lesser contingency. And 
we did that analysis, as I say, over a 12-year period to look to see if we could, if the force could, could deal with all of that, uh, and not all of it just in sequence, but in, in various combinations. And so there's some risk there, uh, but it, it's uh, manageable. Uh, and then we looked at going below that. And of course, the, if uh, sequestration holds, uh, we'll be at 920 in 2019. Uh, so that's 125,000 soldiers out of the Army from the number we'll be at in 2015, the 494s. 125,000 soldiers leave the Army. The challenge is that will be a 25% reduction in our fighting capability, our combat power. That is not easily recoverable. So the first part of that reduction down to 980, as I say, we think is manageable. But uh, as the chief has said in testimony, and, and I think uh, Council on Foreign Relations as well, it's that that last 60,000 across the active guard and reserve, about 30,000 in the active force, makes a big difference in our ability to generate the kind of uh, capabilities necessary to meet our global re uh, responsibilities and also respond to uh, an emerging crisis. And what's important about that the re, you know the response is important, but I think the thing that's more important is our contribution to uh, conventional deterrence. Our enemies are not stupid; they can count our forces. They can see what we're capable of. They can go back and look at what we've done in the past. They're going to recognize that we're uh, going to have less uh, capability going forward. Um, and what I worry about in that regard, the risk that we uh, potentially incur is miscalculation. It's not a question of us not responding. It's a question of them thinking that we won't be, able, they, that our potential adversaries, thinking that we won't be able to respond and backing into a, a, a conflict rather than preventing one. Uh, because as, as I've, I think I said earlier, uh, you know, our, our first responsibility is to prevent conflict especially where it has significant impact. You know, we don't want war in Northeast Asia. Second, third, and 11th largest economies in the world live there. Uh, we don't want war in the, in the Persian Gulf uh, to the extent we can prevent that because that's the global gas station. It has huge geopolitical and economic impacts for the entire globe and our, our economy and our way of life. So our first job is to deter. And if you look at I mentioned that Iraqi Perspectives Project. I believe they in there they have a, a copy of a, a study that the Iraqi War College did on our potential invasion. Now, it was not prescient, but it wasn't too far off either. So, now they weren't listened to, obviously, and, and that was to our advantage. But my point is, our adversaries have people who study us uh, uh, deliberately and continuously. and. I don't think we need to invite uh, conflict by my, uh, and that's what that risk component is. It's that step down from 980 to 920. Now, <clears throat> having said all of that, we recognize that, and we also recognize that we have a responsibility uh, to get the most out of the force that the government, you know, that the nation uh, can afford. And when we think about the future and those trends that I talked about earlier, um, we are looking hard at how we get more out of the force we have because we're not willing just to create that risk and not do anything about it. We, we will do something about it um, because at the end of the day, we have to be engaged around the world. Um, you know, sometimes you need some stand-on capability, not just stand-off capability. And a, a great example of that are the 600 paratroopers from the 173rd you know, the four companies in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland. Uh, those young captains and lieutenants and uh, sergeants and soldiers are the, uh, a physical uh, manifestation of our commitment to our allies there, and they are reassuring them that the million 45,000 soldiers of the United States Army are backing them up. And I think, uh, that's hugely important to maintaining stability and, and the health of that alliance, which has served us very well over the last, what, 60, 70 years. General Hicks, thanks so much for your time. No, thank you.